So the other day I lost a few brain cells because I'm reading this Twitter argument where two people are going back and forth arguing about whether or not a game is good. And so one person was explaining the reasons why they liked the game, why they enjoyed it, and the other one was mocking them simply because of the Metacritic score. They said, look at the Metacritic score, you know, it's in the 70s. And so the guy whose argument relied solely on the Metacritic score had never played the game and didn't even have the platform to play the game. Now, there's definitely no shortage of dumb people on the planet or definitely the internet, but I'm always amazed at how many people actually use this argument and they'll go back and forth about review scores and you'll hear people claim you know a certain platform is better than another platform because if you take all the games and you average up all the Metacritic scores this platform has a three point higher average than that other piece of shit platform or this game is so much better than that other game because it was five points lower on Metacritic. So For the fanboys who rely on Metacritic scores to pump up their confirmation bias, let me read you just a couple of random reviews that I pulled. Uh, And these, I I just listed them in the most helpful. So I looked at the most helpful reviews, and I just clicked on Quantum Break since that's one of the latest games that have come out. So let's look at Ian Vaidai. Uh, This player gave it a 0 out of 10. This whole game is just a huge cutscene. There's no gameplay whatsoever. Even worse, the graphics look like a 360 game. The story is laughable to say the least. Do not buy this garbage game. And 43 out of 55 users found this review helpful. So, in order to kind of understand maybe why somebody completely hated a game, it's it's best to also look at their history. So let's look at the history of I Invite I. So Quantum Break, zero for Xbox. Forza Motorsport 6, zero for Xbox. Probably the worst racing game franchise out there. Every year they just release the same garbage. Uh, Halo 5 for Xbox, also a zero. Game massive disappointment. The graphics are bad. The frame rate is below 30. Which is kind of strange because according to all the, the you know the tech reviewers out there like Digital Foundry, they were all actually complimenting Halo 5 for holding a steady 60 frames per second. So it's not even a 30 frames per second game. Uh, maybe this guy's just got a bad Xbox. Maybe that's why all his Xbox games just happen to be a zero rating. Uh, but MLB The Show, while Forza Motorsport 6 might be putting out the same stuff every year, apparently MLB is definitely upping their game. Uh, That gets a 10 for PlayStation 4. And Bloodborne, uh, that's also a perfect 10 for PlayStation 4. Let's look at another. Here's Gooey Guy. To be honest, I don't think this game is a (laughs) 0, even though he gave it a 0. It's more like a 7. I'm just giving it this to level out all the screeching fanboys that give it a 10 out of 10. Yes, it's a fun game, but the game is far from being perfect. Graphics look kind of lame most of the time, and gameplay can get really clunky and repetitive. It's still an enjoyable title, an enjoyable title that he gave a zero. Uh, And again, more users found this helpful than not. So let's look at uh, Gooey Guy's history. Quantum Break, zero for Xbox. Fallout 4 for PlayStation 4, that's a perfect 10. Uh, Tom Clancy's The Division, perfect 10. He must have been really impressed with the uh, storyline there. Uh, Halo 5 Guardians, zero for Xbox. Uh, Gameplay was just fine, nothing great, nothing awful about it. Just your typical Halo. So just for a typical game, nothing great, nothing awful about it. That also gets a zero on Xbox. And uh, he, he mentions the story in Halo, but apparently he loved the story in Battlefield Hardline because that also got a perfect 10 score for PlayStation 4. And look, I mean, it goes both ways. The point is, besides the fact that obviously there's some people out there who have really sad and pathetic lives to go troll, you know, review sites who go write ghost reviews for games that they've probably never played for a console they probably don't ever own. You've also got people who will go write raving reviews probably for a game that they haven't finished yet or that they haven't even bought yet or played. And you've got some people who will go crazy because maybe they found a game that some reviewer only gave it an 8.5 while the average is 9. So they're wondering why this one horrible reviewer is bringing down the score 
for everybody else. The problem is review scores are nothing more than numbers or stars or whatever it is that they have pulled out of some random person's ass. There's no science to it. There's no formula that everybody adheres to. It's all entirely subjective to what you like. And that goes for all reviews, critics and mainstream sites, as well as personal written ones. So, I mean, you've got major publications who will remove points from a game. For instance, this is, this is a literal reason for having too much water. Or this game uses the A button too much. I've seen that one before in games. Uh, these are, are real legitimate complaints to some reviewers. And while other people will look at that and say, that's stupid. Now, sometimes these publications also have people reviewing types of games that they don't even like. You'll see a, a video review where a reviewer maybe doesn't like first-person shooters, but you see him playing a first-person shooter, he sucks at the game, he's getting creamed, and then proceeds to give the game a bad score. And maybe it's because he really didn't like the game, maybe it's because he doesn't like first-person shooters, he doesn't like the developer, publisher, there's a number of things. Maybe they are legitimate complaints in his mind. Maybe not. You know, sometimes after I watch a movie... That's when I'll actually go and look at review scores. And I swear, if critics hate it, that usually means that I'm going to like it and vice versa. Uh, the ones that they praise, I usually are like, man, you know, the ones that they're talking about is going to win all these sorts of awards or deserves it, whatever, I usually don't care for. But, you know, the other night, it's a perfect example. I was watching um, the movie Divergent, which is a few years old, so I'm a little late to the party a lot of times on movies. But I really liked it. You know, I didn't think it was a masterpiece or anything. I didn't think it should win some Oscars. But I thought it was a good movie, and I enjoyed it a lot. And I like those types of Orwellian movies. And I look on Rotten Tomatoes, and the critics had given it a 40% Rotten score. They hated it. While the audience, they actually liked it, the majority of them. But, but the point is, it's all entirely subjective. Review scores are a simple way for an author to try to tell you in one second their overall opinion of the game. But the problem is, fanboys don't ever bother reading their actual reviews most of the time to find out why a certain score was given. They don't care what the pros and cons were. They just read a number because it's easy for them to comprehend. And so then that way, they can either start praising it or start flaming it. And most games are entirely different. You can't even compare a lot of games. You know, some people will look at a site who maybe gave Resogun a 4 out of 5 stars. And maybe that same site gave GTA 5 a 3.5 out of 5 stars. Which game is better? The games aren't even comparable. And some people are going to hate Resogun. Some people are going to love it. The same thing goes for GTA. Maybe some people thought GTA was a 5 out of 5. Some people thought it was a 1 out of 5, depending on what you like. So I think it's really just crazy and silly when people get upset about review sites and the scores that they give. Like, I really don't care. I think it's dumb when people brag about scores or use it as ammo in their tribal wars. You're a lot better off finding people who just have the same taste as you. And then you can rely on their opinions a little bit more than just some generic number somebody pulled out of the clouds. Uh, games, movies, art, they're not something you can easily rate on a scale that's going to be universal to everybody. And so that's why I rarely ever even read reviews. If there's like an overarching problem with a game, like usually I'll pay attention to that. Like if there's like poor performance that everybody's talking about or, or somebody says, you know, this game's full of bugs and I keep on seeing that pop up, you know, then I'll keep that in the back of my mind or if the game's super short, things like that. But I really don't care what anybody else's opinion is in order to make my own. I know what I like. I know what I enjoy. And I can usually watch just a few minutes of gameplay and determine whether or not it's a game that looks like something that I'd want to play. And what I'd like to play may not be something that you want to. Some people are going to hate games like GTA or Battlefield or Halo, and then some people are going to love slasher games like Dark Souls and Bloodborne. I'm the complete opposite. I cannot get into those slasher-type games. But I'm not going to tell anybody who loves those games that they suck or that they're not good. 
Like, that's just crazy. In the end, review scores are a simple review for the simple-minded. It's how the gamer came up with that score, which is the real meaning of it. And that's why, as I've told you before, I try to just show you gameplay, talk about the game, what I like, what I didn't like, and let you decide for yourself whether or not it's worth it. Our review score is going to go away? No, absolutely not. But should you put a lot of faith in them or present them as gospel? Only if you're one of those simple-minded gamers. That does it for me, The Red Dragon. I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Are you listening? Damn. Yeah.